Ready? All right. So welcome to week two. And uh, Stephanie, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy you're here. This is probably my favorite thing here we're doing today, teaching you how I teach students about the animal kingdom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you my slideshow here. Um, so Animal Kingdom is just getting students even more excited about something that they have an intrinsic thirst to learn about animals. All kids love animals. There's not a child I've ever met who didn't love animals. And so I hope you take away some great ideas today. Um, so we're going to use animals to fuel their thirst for biology, the science of studying living things. This is for young children, although this unit could really be used for lots of kids. I think a lot of different age ranges would find this interesting. And this is going to be super integrated. Once again, I happen to be fully virtual right now. That might change shortly for lots of us. But again, anything we can do virtually, we definitely can do in any model of learning. Trust me on that. So we're going to be digging really deep into lots of different things, including classification of animals by attributes, learning about adaptations, life cycles, food chains, habitats, behaviors, and I'm going to share some um, tips and strategies on how I made this interesting and engaging for students virtually. Um, I just want to just kind of review in case anybody would miss this, that when we bring the hands on online, we increase engagement. Um, and at my school, every two weeks, like clockwork, kiddos come in a one and a half hour time frame to pick up learning materials. You can see a picture there of some of the gift bags of stuff I've sent. Um, I think I've sent a total of 13 kits so far this year. Um, and I do ask, you know, if you're going to distribute, make it a little exciting, maybe play some music, do some theme days, hand out some popsicles, throw a little sucker in there, make it interesting. The kids are really excited to see their teacher face to face, even if it's through a car and a mask. So try to have fun with it. Um, make sure that all the items that you're including, you're going to use usually live with students. I, I call my classroom TV school. They come to TV school where I do engaging things with them and students learn science by doing science and the hand on materials are going to give them lots of things to talk about and experiences to talk about. And when we work with young children, we want to remember that they're all learning language because they're young children. They're learning our language and we want to give them many opportunities to speak about their learning um, because that's how they build their oral language and their vocabulary. Moving forward, um, please remember that if you have kids coming into your virtual class, your real class, wherever they're going to be, they need to know what to bring. And so here's an example. I post a picture every night on my Google Classroom and the kiddos can go through their kit and pull out the things that they need to bring ring and some of the things in this picture we will be talking about today. So this is a great unit because it's so integrative. Everything I do is very integrated. I am not, okay, here's ELA, here's science, here's math. That has never been how I teach. I can find the thread through it all. And so this is going to incorporate biology, geography, climate study, reading, writing, music, visual art, math. There's so much here. And um, I hope hope that it also gives your students a lot of opportunities to talk about their learning and interact during virtual or real class. And when we're doing um, new things and trying new things as educators, we need to be very patient with our families. Um, this is always an opportunity to help them be better problem solvers. Oh, Miss Steph, I, I cut my puppets out. Okay, well, we were going to do that together today. Can you try to remember not to go ahead of me? And you're going to have to just work on maybe coloring them today while the rest of us are doing that. Sometimes kids go ahead of you. Sometimes kids lose things. Sometimes um, their parents throw it away. And we need to be really flexible and patient if we expect our students to be flexible and patient with us and our families, right? So please know your real life superhero. I appreciate the work educators are doing and you can help them develop one of the most important executive functioning skills in the world problem solving. It'll serve them well anywhere they go in life. So I'm going to now talk to you about how I start out my unit. So to start my unit, 
Um, the middle picture there shows a tiny little hippo in an organza bag. That was one item I sent to my students. And I use this book, ABC Zoo Borns, because, well, it has baby animals. And if you don't like baby animals, I mean, come on. Um, so I got these very cheap little animals and I put them in an organza bag. And when I sent my kit home, I had a special little project along with it. And it's going to be um, a home project. And I'm going to show you the letter that I sent with these zooborns because it wasn't like, here's a prize. Enjoy your little hippo. There, it, it was something much more deep. And um, so what? here is the letter I sent. And so I, I sent this letter to them and we all opened it up together, our little zoo baby. And it says, this is your new zoo baby. Unfortunately, the Albuquerque Biopark couldn't accommodate this newborn baby. They've asked me to find a loving home for it. And of course I chose you. Kids are so bored, you guys. This is such an easy time to bring the spirit of play out of them. They're sick of being home with their parents. Sometimes their parents are a little sick of being home with them. To get a little animal and a little assignment for my kids, they ate this up. It seems so simple and silly, but if you present it properly, you're gonna enchant them. And so I told them their project was to make a habitat for their zoo baby. I explained it was a safe place to eat, rest, and play, and that they could use anything at home, boxes, blocks, and they need to care for their baby, name their baby, and research the baby with their family. They all have technology now. It's a great opportunity for them to be doing some research. And I did tell them, if your baby seems bored, you may want to introduce her or him to other toy animals, and as you research, please find the most interesting fact about your zoo born and bring it back to class. And so they got to share one interesting fact about their zoo baby and show off their habitat. And um, it was really fun and they enjoyed sharing interesting facts. I enjoyed learning in interesting facts. And um, the next day or the next week actually, when they started presenting, their zoo facts, I brought in my class puppet and I'm gonna introduce you to her now. I am a strong believer in teaching um, science through puppetry and teaching anything through puppetry. And if your students don't listen, I always tell people, throw on a puppet. They will talk to your puppet if they won't talk to you. And so I'm gonna introduce you to my class assistant, Amelia. And um, this is a, Amelia's house. I have had this house for 10 years. Um, it's made out of a Banana Republic bag. You can see my, my puppet there waving. Um, I went to a NACI conference many years ago and learned from a woman named Joyce Davis all about using puppetry in the classroom. And if you're frightened by puppets, you don't have to be a ventriloquist, okay? It's okay if your mouth moves. The kids know it's you guys, okay? If a kid ever says, oh, teacher, I know that's you. You say, you know what? You're right. You don't have to pretend it's not you. They're, the kids know it's, it, it, it's, it's not a real human. They know it's a puppet. Um, a couple things, your puppet should always come out alive. Your, your kids should not see your limp noodle puppet ever. Um, if you have a class sidekick puppet, it's incredibly important that you have a place where it stays. It could be a box bag, doesn't have to be fancy, but when it comes out, it is alive. Don't be terrified. Everybody has three puppet voices. You have your voice, you have a high voice, and you have a low voice, and I bet you could find even more voices. Never stereotype another culture or accent. That's something I do want to say. That would not be a nice thing to do. Um, but find a cool puppet voice for your puppet, and your puppet comes out alive. Now, your class puppet is never for kids to use, never for kids to touch. It's good to have lots of puppets for your kids, but this is your class sidekick, and she has a personality, or he has a personality of his own. So I'm going to pull out my class puppet right now, and my class puppet came to class. This is Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Can you say hello? Hello, guys. How are you doing? Why are there adults? Oh, I see. You're, where are the kids? Amelia, Amelia, this is a workshop for grownups today. I know. You teach grownups. I guess sometimes I do. But I wanted to tell them about how you help the kiddos get excited about learning about animals. So what Amelia did, she came into class when they were telling their animal facts. 
And she said, oh, this is so exciting because she, what were you going to do? I was getting a pet fish. Yes, she was getting a pet fish. Why did you want a pet fish? I could walk my fish and cuddle it at night. And the kids went wild. Oh my gosh, you cannot walk your fish. What is she going to do? She's going to kill that fish. My kids love Amelia. They beg for her, beg for her. And they know if they interrupt and they're just, or jump up in real class and try to, that she will go in her house and they will not see her again. So they be, I mean, a puppetry, kids love it. And you have so many opportunities to solve problems and talk to your puppet about anything. And so she's an amazing sidekick and her being inept about getting a pet was a really great opportunity for me to say, oh my gosh, you guys, Amelia's going to get a fish and she might kill it. Can you help Amelia learn about animals so that she can make a smart decision? And so that is when we decided, okay, we're going to have to learn more about animals and help her. How many animals are there in this world? What kind of animals? What do they need? And so Amelia began coming. This was our kickoff project after Zooborns um, to learn about animals with us and joined us for Pet Show and Tell, where my students could bring their pets into virtual class and tell Amelia, here's my pet. Here's what my pet needs from me. And here's what it's like to be a responsible pet owner. And so we helped her. And at the end of our animal research and studies, then she got a pet. And what did you end up getting? A fish. She still got a fish. But do you know how to take care of your fish? I sure do. Those kids taught me. They taught you very well. Amelia, Amelia's favorite thing is to read. I bet you have some good books you want to read. I'm going to let you go home. Bye, guys. All right, we're going to put Amelia down. I always say she has a Marge Simpson voice, but um, that's a little scratchy. Now you're going to see a picture of me with Amelia. When you dig into the animal kingdom, there's a lot of different things. I did give you in your lesson plan a nice video breaking down the animal kingdom. I use a throwaway chart <laughs> from forever ago that someone was getting rid of by I guess McGraw Hill. Um, I love this. This is probably from the 80s or 70s, but it's still very pertinent and amazing. And I just kind of start breaking it down and we start just comparing vertebrates to invertebrates. Those, those are the major two categories, animals who have a backbone, animals who don't. And so I'm going to keep going because I have a lot of information today. Um, and Pam is watching. If you have a question, just type it in and she will interrupt me. I interrupt sometimes, so it's okay for her to inter interrupt me. And so when you break down the animal kingdom with kids, you definitely want to start with the vertebrates and the invertebrates. And I don't expect my students to memorize all of this information you're seeing. I do expect them to understand um, that the major categories of vertebrates include mammals, birds, amphibians, fish, and reptiles. And that they can also be further broken down into warm and cold blooded. And then that invertebrates, I do want them to understand arthropods. Arthropods are um, animals that have jointed legs. And um, I expect them to understand the differences between crustaceans, insects, arachnids, and mirapods. If you're not aware, mirapods are things like centipedes and millipedes, very segmented. We do touch on mollusks. I do not expect them to understand things like the jellyfish or the single-celled um, organisms. And it's just, it, I do touch on it, but those aren't things that they're gonna memorize, but it's okay to expose them to them, of course. And so when we dig in, these are my favorite books and I've listed them all in um, our lesson plan. These are the books that I use in this unit. I could have gone, um, crazy with this, but I had to eventually say no more books. Um, so we're just going to break it down by category for mammals. I, these are the things I want my students to know. If you can get the creative teaching press um, posters, I don't know, those are available for pretty cheap. They have them for um, at least the five vertebrates. And that's the mammals poster. Those are wonderful resources. I used to throw those on the floor in my real classroom for a small group. And we would take all the toy animals in our classroom and dump them out. And together we'd talk and we just put them on the right poster. We just categorize them. Let's look at this lion. Well, it has fur. 
Okay, it must be a mammal. Well, what about this? What the heck is a shark? I guess that's a fish. The kids really love that. And it was really good for discussion. And the, the posters are very simple and have a lot of information. So I expect them to know humans are mammals. Mammals are vertebrates. Mammals are fed milk. They often have fur. They're warm blooded. They give birth to live young, except for those two strange oviparous mammals that um, both live in Australia, the um, spiny echidna or anteater, um, and then the um, duckbill platypus. Um, I want them to understand whales are mammals. And um, just so you know, all dolphins are whales. Um, not all whales are dolphins. And I definitely talk to them about nursing women at this time because I'm a lactating woman and I always want my students to understand it's okay if you see a woman with a, or someone breastfeeding out in public, that it's just totally normal because um, some kids get really nervous about that. Not everybody's taught that at home. And um, this is a, a doll I have in my classroom. That's a kitten that has magnetic teeth and a little kitten stick. And, and also, I used to take kids to the state fairgrounds. They always have a mother pig with the little piglets nursing. It's so good for kiddos to see that. And to also talk about not all babies are fed that way. Um, just to make sure that they you're normalizing bodies with them and the fact that some babies drink milk. Um, so that is what I expect them to know about mammals. They usually come with quite a bit of information about mammals to begin with. Um, I do think that uh, studying dinosaurs and oviparous animals, animals who ate, lay eggs, is a really fun um, tie-in to this unit. You don't have to study dinosaurs with this. Um, for us, we waited until the end of our animal unit and kicked off a whole nother unit about dinosaurs. Um, so this was not, but if you're studying classifications, you definitely could use a dinosaur activity for reptiles. Um, things I want them to know that they're dry and scaly including snakes, lizards, and turtles, that dinosaurs were reptiles, that reptiles are cold-blooded vertebrates, and usually oviparous. There are some viparous um, reptiles, some snakes, but they still have an egg in them that hatches and then it comes out alive. So it's kind of tricky for kids. But we did, um, so on the far right, you're seeing a really beautiful set that I purchased for my students of dino eggs that we excavated together. We predicted what was inside. I put um, in an envelope, each of the eggs comes with a card and I put it in the envelope. So when they were done, they got to see their little information card about their dinosaur. This was kind of expensive. I think $40 for a set of 24. Um, it would definitely be a good thing to use your golden apple money if you got some on, but you could also use salt dough and buy really cheap little dinosaurs and put homemade salt dough around them. And then they could do a similar excavation process. You could also model fossilization with toys by sticking them in homemade Play-Doh. These are things that I've done every year. I love to teach them about the process of fossilization and how scientists know about the history of our earth. How do we know that dinosaurs were here long before us? Um, it's really important for them to understand that process. If you have not checked out the book Dinosaur Lady yet, Gosh, it's um, a book about uh, Mary Anning, one of the first paleontologists. And Mary Anning, when she was alive, um, she was a very poor little girl in England and her daddy had to sell seashells on the beach because they had no money. And that's when she became interested in finding treasure. And she found the first ever um, dinosaur fossil and everybody thought it was a monster. And what was so interesting about the story is that um, even though she was so well versed and started this field because she was female, she wasn't allowed to um, teach a lecture at a university, let alone go to a class or even go to a class at a university. And so um, my students, that's really like powerful for them when they hear that. And when I was a little girl, um, I never really learned about female scientists. And I think it's, you know, really important that we make sure that females are empowered in the field of sciences. Um, and so I have two books about female sciences today in our, our presentation is that is the first one and it's such a great book. Um, and it's very simple. I was able to read it in a sitting and the kids just loved it. Um, this is when I study fish with them. We went deeply into sharks. I sent home some shark teeth with my students. They were really excited about um, things that I expect my students to know about fish, that they live in water, they're vertebrates, cold-blooded, and they breathe oxygen through the water. Um, 
from the water through their gills. Um, I did not give you instructions on how to make that little whale, um, but we made that whale after reading Who Would Win Killer Whale versus Great White Shark. My kids this year really enjoy those books. They're pretty cheap on Scholastic. And um, we had a lot of fun learning about sharks and learning about Eugenie Clark. Um, Eugenie Clark was a scientist who couldn't stand how everyone was so afraid of sharks. And as a little girl, she was very interested. And she made a lot of really interesting discoveries about sharks in Mexico at La Isla Mujeres. And she um, is very was very well respected in that field. And I really enjoyed that book, as did my students. And again, celebrating a female scientist um, there's nothing more important so um, for our kids and it's about inclusion you want your kids to see themselves in books and um, girls need to know that they um, that that they're female scientists um, so I'm really glad that that I found both of those books and I hope you find that helpful um, we do um, talk about diet we talk about food chains and I'm going to teach you a song you're going to get a copy of this song um, card that you see here, um, Charlotte Diamond, that is an album, <laughs> 10 Carat Diamond from the 1980s. And um, she does a really cute version of a song called Octopus. And I researched all the animals in Octopus and the food chain in Octopus in this song is incredibly accurate. And so I'm going to sing it. I'm sorry to sing at you again, but I do want you to hear this um, song. And I did link this song on YouTube on our um, lesson plan so you can find it. You could probably buy it for 99 cents as well, but it's going to go like this. And my kiddos made puppets and we did this. And remember that you might have a different class than me. Sometimes the food chain and predators can be really upsetting to certain kids. Sometimes culturally, certain animals might be upset, uh, it might be upsetting to a certain person. And so it's our job as educators to know our audience and, and, and be respectful. If a family came to you and you were dissecting owl pellets and they said, I'm sorry, in our family, that's, that's not okay. The correct answer is, oh, gosh, thank you for letting me know that. I want to support your family. And to, you know, it, it, there's no reason to be offended by someone saying that's culturally not appropriate for me. And so just so you know, um, some kids do get upset about the food chain. I always tell kids, I say, well, they'll be like, oh my gosh, the polar bear eats the baby seal. And yeah, well, do you like the polar bear? The polar bear has to eat too. You know, that we all need to eat and animals kill for food. Um, they're very, that they, they have one mission to eat. So um, here's how this one goes. Now this is a food chain story or song. And um, to build knowledge, I used Animals Are Delicious. Those are three fold out food chain books that I really enjoy that are very, very short. And they basically go through the food chain and at the end of the day, they say, and nobody's hungry because everybody got fed. So here's the song. Slippery fish, slippery fish, sliding through the water. Slippery fish, slippery fish, bloop, bloop, bloop. Oh no, it's been eaten by, um, here's a mollusk, octopus. Octopus squiggling in the water. Octopus, octopus, gloop, gloop, gloop. Oh no, it's been eaten by a tuna fish, tuna fish flashing in the water. Tuna fish, tuna fish, gloop, gloop. Oh no, it's been eaten by a dun 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 great white shark, great white shark lurking in the water. Great white shark, great white shark. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Oh no, it's been eaten by a Humongous whale, humongous whale, spouting in the water. Humongous whale, humongous whale, gloop, gloop, gloop.
and then we make the him burp at the end. So this is really fun just to start the food chain. And if you research this, killer whales do eat sharks. Um, sharks do love um, yellowtail, or I think it's yellowfin tuna. And um, their favorite food is the octopus, apparently. And octopus will eat small fish. And octopus, you can say octopi or octopuses. Octopuses actually have a beak that is terrifying to me. And so if you didn't know that, you should definitely um, show it to your kids. It looks like a parrot beak. And some mollusks are incredibly creepy. Now, of course, I use my song card for singing, for finding word families, for finding high frequency words. But another idea I had when I was writing this up is you could make up a song using different verbs, different animals, different adjectives about any food chain. And so it could be, you know, tiny gnat, tiny gnat flying near the pond. You know, you could make it, it really have it get, have fun with this. So I love that song. There are a lot of different artists who do the song. You will get masters of those puppets. My kids had so much fun with the puppetry. Um, when we talk about birds, I expect students to know that birds are oviparous, they lay eggs, they're vertebrates, warm-blooded, they live on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, most birds fly, not all, they build their nests or homes and some migrate. I use the book Birds by Kevin Hankis. I um, have three art projects I do with students in a year based on that book. I want students looking at birds and I sent home feathers and they have their watercolors. And we used one quote from that book, for that book, if birds made marks with their tail feathers when they flew, think of what this, what the sky would look like. I love that quote. And so we always get into our headspace. I want you to think about the birds. Think about the birds flying. Use your paintbrush and paint what you see. And my, everyone's successful at this one. And I was like blown away by how beautiful the artwork was. So just an art extension on that. There's a lot you can do with birds, but that's what I did in this. Um, amphibians. I love teaching about amphibians and you see there an accordion book I do on the life cycle. Definitely want to talk about life cycles. Um, I fold up the accordion books on sentence strips and I send home green dot stickers, you know, those cheap ones from Office Depot or whatever. And uh, we talk about the life cycle of a frog. A frog typically will lay its egg above water. And some frogs have little clear eggs. So that first one is the egg. Um, and usually when it's born, it'll go right down into the water if it doesn't get eaten first. And it's a little baby tadpole. It's more like a fish than it is um, you know, a frog and that it gets its hind legs and starts grow, um, losing its tail front legs and it's a full blown frog. And so my students do that with just five dot stickers and adding the tail, as you can see in that illustration, they love it. They love to read it. And on the front, it says um, life cycle of the frog. I, um, I gave you some copies of some frog and toad puppets we make. We act out frog and toad stories all year. That's, those are some of my favorite stories because they're so easy to act out with kids. And and uh, we did a comparison of frog and toad to real frogs. Um, one thing we learned is that frogs don't drink water. They, they get it through their, they absorb it through their skin. Um, but frog and toad have a tea party and drink tea, things like that. Kind of like a, a compare contrast. Um, but that's totally optional. I just think it's always good to take characters that are fictional and compare them when you're learning information about real amphibians. I expect children to know that amphibians, um, spend part of their life in water and part of their life on land. Um, and if you haven't read Fish is Fish, that's one book I didn't put in here. Oh, it's a really good one because it's about a fish and a tadpole that are friends. And then the tadpole becomes a frog and goes to see the world. And fish is very envious. And fish is like, I want to do this too, and tries and realizes not cut out to be on the land. Fish is fish would be another great um, text with this. Um, I do very little on mollusks, but I did do, and I did give you this resource, um, Norman the Slug with the Silly Shell. We make paper plate silly shells. This is a story about a snail, uh, a slug who's jealous of the snail shells um, and he gets all these silly shells. And so we have fun writing about our own silly shells and it helps us remember words like invertebrate, um, because they're invertebrates and as well as um, 
mollusk. Um, if you've ever heard of the band Ween, there is a um, song called the Mollusk Song, totally appropriate for kids. Again, not all their songs are, but the Mollusk Song is a great one. And I did not mention that in my, my lesson plan. So if you want to remember that, write it down. Um, now here in Albuquerque, it's a perfect place for snail observations here in New Mexico when it's raining and spring is coming. Um, and these are some little terrariums I had sent. I actually sent a live insect in each one. Again, not all families would want that. I had a family who didn't want it and that's okay. Respect your family's wishes. But I made these little terrariums and you could send them. They just have um, mason jars and you just put screen on top and they're great for temporary habitats to observe animals um, like little bugs or something that they find outside. Oh, and if your kids talk about roly polies, just so you know, those are crustaceans in case you were not aware. Um, we're going to keep going. So getting that down into arthropods, this is my favorite part. And I hope you understand how I teach about the honeybee after we do this. You're going to get two lesson plans, one about the animal kingdom and one specifically about how I teach about pollination. And so I'm going to do a quick little, um, a quick little stutter, a little, little puppet show for you. Um, I talked to you a little bit about puppets earlier. The most important part of a puppet, in case you didn't know it, is the eyes. Um, you can make anything come to life with eyes. If I glued googly eyes on my scissors, they too could be a puppet. I've glued googly eyes on everything, trust me. And so these are just silk flowers, price cost a dollar. I glued on some googly eyes. And we go deeply into one insect, the honeybee in my classroom in this unit. And I'm going to talk to you about that. So again, anything's a puppet if you glue eyes. And for this, I usually use a puppet that looks really realistic, like the one you see um, second over there. I love that one. It even has the dangling empty finger hole for the six legs. I love an accurate insect puppet. Um, but today I'm going to use this little paper guy. This was a gift from a student after we studied bees. And I think it's so cute. Um, so here's how the puppet show goes. And this is something you might want to take notes on if you want to replicate this puppet show. We're going to we're going to um, do a puppet show to teach kids very quickly about what pollination is. And then um, we're going to model pollination using some yummy, um, some yummy foods. So let's go ahead and get started. I love these two books I showed you. But for pollination, um, what I tell students is that um, for flowers and fruits and trees to make, reproduce, they need to be pollinated. And there's a big problem. They can't move. <laughs> you know, they have their roots. They cannot move. They cannot walk to one another. And I tell students, if you've ever like smelled a flower and had yellow on your nose, you got some pollen on your nose. And most of the kids, I was like, oh yeah, I've seen that, especially in things like tulips, you can really find it. And so I tell them, well, we're going to see how bees help with this. Since these flowers can't move to one another to transfer pollo, pollen, they need some, some help. And so here's how the puppet show goes. You just need two silk flowers and a bee puppet. And you explain to the children that all the worker bees are girls. I know you're like, gosh, she's crazy about girls today. All the worker bees are girls. Um, so the worker bees are the ones you see at the flowers. They're always girls. They can sting you. And to sting is to protect their hive. And when they sting you, they die. Um, they, their stinger comes out, it's barbed, and they lose part of their organs. And so they, they really did it in the name of their hive. So we never swat at bees. But these flowers have sweet nectar in them. And bees love to visit and they have a little curly tongue, sort of like a butterfly, and they suck that nectar out of the flowers to make honey in their stomachs. It's so weird when you're eating honey, you're eating bee puke. Um, and so how I do the puppet show, once I've given them the basics, I do a little puppet show and it goes like this. You have your two flowers and one of them goes, yoo-hoo, yes. I really need some of your pollen. Oh yeah, we need to make some seeds. So next spring, there are more of us. Well, could you walk on over here and give me some of that pollen, please? <clears throat> oh my gosh, I just realized I don't have any legs. You know what? I don't have legs either. Maybe a wind will blow and we can exchange pollen. Let's watch the wind. <gasps> that didn't work. Let's try the other way. 
that didn't work. We need some help. What we need is a B. B, 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 B. And the B drinks the nectar. And without even knowing, pollen sticks to the B. And he goes to the, she goes to the next flower. And some of that pollen falls up. Yay, I got some of your pollen. Sounds like we're gonna have a lot of baby flowers in the spring. So this is a great way to teach them about pollination, but you need to model it. And I'm gonna talk to you about that. Um, some of you might not do this because of food allergies and that's totally okay. But the way I do it, and you're gonna get everything you need. Um, I use three things, cupcake liners, Cheetos, and Starburst. Starburst represents nectar in the flower. So if you see that flower there in the center is a cupcake liner. And inside of that is one Starburst. That's the nectar that attracts the bee who wants to make honey out of that nectar. Now on top of it, you see the Cheetos. So you have the kids pretend to be bees. You put a bee sticker on their hand and they go in and they're, they're digging around trying to suck up the nectar. And guess what, st what sticks to your fingers when you do this, guys? Cheeto dust. Have you ever, e if you've eaten one Cheeto, you, there is nothing in the food world more or anywhere more like pollen than Cheeto, fake cheeks. Um, and so it sticks on their little fingers and then they touch another flower to rub it off. It's as simple as that. And then we have a wonderful recording sheet. My hand represented, well, it represented the bee. The cheese puff dust represented, it represented the pollen and the candy. And I put candy instead of Starburst so you could use what you want, represented um, obviously the nectar. And I tell them, smell it, it's sweet. It smells like nectar. Nectar is a sweet liquid. And when I touched a flower, pollen fell off. So this is honestly, my kids are pollination experts after I do this. And it's a very simple process. I used to let them pollinate their friend's flower, but in a pandemic world, nobody pollinates anybody else's flowers. We have to make sure. So now I'm gonna move into one of my other favorite activities I do. And this is kind of an assessment activity at the very end. And it's um, how we, I teach them about adaptations and get them to show me what they know about the animal kingdom and adaptations. So let's talk about adaptations. Adaptations are special skills helping animals survive. They can be physical changes, behavioral, um, or even how a society, an animal or society does things in their daily lives. Usually the things my students um, choose to um, or learn most about and understand most about are the physical adaptations. So Those seem to make the most sense to them. And so I do something called adaptation critters and you're gonna get this beautiful recording sheet and I send a bag, bag of goodies that looks just like that. Um, this is how they're gonna show what they know. So they're gonna make up an imaginary species. What did I put in that bag? I put foam shapes, feathers, pipe cleaners, which are now called Chanel stems apparently. Um, googly eyes, twist ties, the sky's the limit. Send what you have or what you can access. And so what they're gonna be doing is making a species of animal and they need to have a name for their animal, a habitat, a diet, and a special adaptation. And then remember an adaptation is what's gonna help this animal survive. And then they have to decide, is it a mammal, a bird, a reptile, amphibian? I, I put the major categories there. Um, and they draw their species. And I'm gonna show you, um, I also, to make it easier for them to understand, sent each of my students home an example animal. That took a long time. You might not do that. You might just show one and say, this is my creature. But my kids, it was like a prize I made for them because I apparently psychotically had a lot of time to make these. I had fun with them. They're kind of cute. And so I sent those little critters. Those were my big eyed green hoppers that lived in the Amazon rainforest. They ate nocturnal bugs and the adaptation included their large eyes for night vision because they needed to see the little nocturnal eye um, bugs that they eat. And they were green to camouflage in the Amazon rainforest and to hide from predators. And they have springy tails to hang from branches and catch bugs. I'm gonna show you some examples over the years. These recording sheets, 
I love you all so much. I made them prettier than this for you. Um, but you can see we have a purple water tooth. Um, uh, that's from this year. A student took that picture. That's why you can barely see the critter in the side, but it lives in the ocean. It eats blue coral and it can shoot water out of its eyes at predators. And that picture um, is very well labeled. That is one of my students. And interestingly enough, that is an insect, according to my student. Um, and then you see a blatat. It lives on water and its special um, adaptation was it could live in every water around. And when you have young kids, sometimes their adaptation might seem really imaginary and not make sense. But if they're making it in their mind, it's okay. It's okay because they're getting this process and it eats small fish. Um, and we see, I love this one from a few years ago. Um, that one special adaptation is it looks like a flower. That's an animal that looks like a flower. And you can just see a few more examples of things my students made. And so I've had 100% success with this, um, both online um, and in real class. It's such a fun activity and the kids usually want to make more. And actually, um, I'm going to show you here on the right the far right, um, do you see all those little critters? That was one of my students this year who just kept going with it. He couldn't stop inventing little creatures. And let me tell you, he came to class to tell me about every single one and what its adaptation was and where it lived. And that's that's what we want, guys. We want these kids excited about their learning and talking about it. Um, one thing that's really easy to do, your kids probably have toys at home or magazines with pictures of animals, animal scavenger hunt of sorts where they bring their toys to class and, you know, you can say, okay, hold up a mammal. Who has a mammal today? Hold up an animal that walks on four legs. Anybody have an arthropod? They might not have every category. However, it's really fun for them and they love to show off their toys. And this is a great way for them to just hold it up and not tell you a 10 year story, right? And another one is animal charades where you tell a couple kids or one kid turn around and then you show them a picture. Okay be an octopus and then the kid turns around and we all pantomime and act like octopi and oh you're an octopus they love that game super easy that's just a picture of animals that I brought to class um, one day when we were playing the game um, about the animal scavenger hunt um, as far as writing there are a lot of writing opportunities you've already seen um, top left you're seeing a napkin book I stapled napkins and I collect them and I staple paper in them and I make them into books seems silly. Kids love it. We wrote about bats in our bat books. Um, that's a very simple nature journal we made. This is a great time to get your kids out observing animals wherever you may live. There are animals, there are bugs. I happen to have a lot of bugs in my house, especially the cucarachas at this time of year. And this book that I'm showing you here is called Lifetime. And it is a wonderful book because it's all about numbers in the animal kingdom. Uh, I would suggest you use this book to practice writing numbers. I'm gonna give you an example um, in one lifetime. This woodpecker will drill 30 roosting holes in the woods, rat-a-tat-tat. Um, and I give you a template where your kids could do some research and you could make your own class book using lifetime animal facts. A caribou sheds and regrows antlers on average 10 times. As I read this story the other day to my students, they pulled out their whiteboards and wrote every number. And if they didn't know how, I always tell kids, it's okay not to know, edit your work. I'll hold up the answer and you can change it if you didn't have it. You don't learn, you don't know everything, your kids. Everyone makes mistakes. We learn from mistakes. It's okay if you don't have all the answers. I can get them to you or find them with you if I need to. Uh, math integration, definitely this game, the Hungry Predator Number Chomp. You can have your students make those out of popsicle sticks and Google eyes. And this is such a great game because it's so easy to differentiate. You could use one die or two dice and compare, okay, six to two. Um, and then you could definitely use as many dice as you want. So they could make really big numbers. Here we're showing that 44 is less than 51. We talked about predators. We had a field trip about predators. So my kiddos really enjoyed that. Um, we also do a lot of tangrams. At the beginning of the year, I read a book called Tangram Magic that I love, a very old out of print one, but there are a lot of different tangram books and you can send paper tangrams and I do link some Tangram stuff for you, or you can buy, I think I spent about $15 for a pack of 30 plastic Tangrams. They were not pre-collated. 
but um, tangram animals, and if you don't know what tangrams are, feel free to ask, um, but tangram animals are so fun for my students. They seem to have endless stamina for that activity. And I've linked a wonderful website where you can print tangrams and you can find lots of puzzles for the kids to solve. This is a great book. I actually met Laura Vaccaro Seeger at a NACI conference. And my favorite book of hers is one, or I'm sorry, April Pooley Sawyer. I met her. Um, one is a snail, 10 is a crab. And this is a book about how a snail has one foot and a crab, a crustacean has 10 feet, and then they go in deeper and they count feet on animals. And I always do a big class problem where I say, well, how many feet are in our class? And how could we figure that out? I love math talks with kids. And this was a really easy way for me to get them talking about, well, how would we solve that? Okay, I have a bunch of beans, I could do that. How many kids, I could put the, um, you know, the feet, the beans. I have 16 kids in my class, so we're gonna do two, 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 two. And, and the kids really enjoy it. And it's something that it's okay to guide them through if you need to, or let them um, go do it on their own. Often when I'm teaching math, you know, because I have so many different levels, Okay, if you want to work on this alone, you can turn down the volume on your iPad and you can do it. But if you need my help right now, let's work on this together. And that's okay. That's differenti you know, differentiating everything live for your kids to the best of your ability. And it's okay if you need help. Um, as far as geography and animals, like I said last week, if you're not using every lesson as a store, uh, uh, um, an opportunity or every unit as an opportunity to learn about a new place, new people, new cultures, um, you're missing a great opportunity. And this is just the perfect opportunity for them to study other parts of the world and learn about animals. And again, as a teacher, you do not need to be the expert. It's okay to learn with your students. And since they have all of these wonderful iPads and laptops, they can do the research on their own. I have some great free websites I listed for kids to do research. Um, it's also a really important time to discuss human impact on animals, both positive and negative. And I find when I talk about animals and, you know, talk about global warming and the fact that, you know, we're losing ice and the polar bears can't hunt for seals without the ice, things like that. Um, kids start saying, oh my gosh, I don't like that because they do care about animals. And it's a great opportunity for a service learning project that they initiate to evolve um, because kids like to help animals. And you can say, well, oh, you like animals? How could you help animals? What could we do? And it might be something as simple as, you know, getting supplies for a local um, pet shelter, or it might be something where they need to write to a scientist and say, I heard about this problem. We kids want to help. We're collecting. Can we collect money for you? What could we do to help you? Um, don't ever be afraid to defer your kids to experts. And those are some great free websites that I did list in our lesson plan. Um, uh, this year, I brought a lot of experts and animals into my class in different ways. Of course, we did. We kicked off with the pet show and tell with my puppet, Amelia. But we also um, had the Albuquerque Biopark Zoo and Botanic Garden. They both offer wonderful programs at $50. They'll customize them for $75. Um, and that brings educators to your Google Meet or your platform with live animals. And this year we got to see a Goliath beetle, a huge um, giant walking stick, which they let me name Meatball, which I was pretty excited about, um, a really hyperactive armadillo and some of the predators. Um, I also linked where you could go to schedule that yourself, the Natural History Museum. If you do do dinosaurs or sharks, they have several free programs where they will come to your class to teach your students about dinosaurs. And if you, um, a lot of areas in science do change. Oh, that dinosaur is actually this dinosaur. Oh, Pluto's not a planet. You know, it's important that you realize that and remember that. And that's why it's so cool when you have the Natural History Museum come because you get real scientists in your class and you can learn the newest stuff from them for the following year. And so please, when, when they come, don't just like use it to snooze, like really listen and take notes because they have such amazing information about dinosaurs and flying swimming reptiles of our Earth's past. Kids love dinosaurs. Um, and also there are lots of live feeds from zoos or zoo cams. And Miss Pam was saying even just actual um, footage of animals in natural habitats as well all around the world. I've linked a few here on um, the San Diego Zoo has 13 different animals on zoo cam guys. So definitely check it out. Um, remember when you're accessing materials, kids have more fun in a hands-on environment to get materials, donors choose. 
build your lessons around things you already have. Apply for one of our mini grants. Off. Um, go to Buy Nothing New Mexico. Actually, one of our attendees went there and got a lot of baby food jars already. Ask your friends, your families, your parents, acquaintances, and strangers. You'll never know unless you ask. And I want you to know, I appreciate you guys so much. Teachers are my heroes. And um, these are some pictures that my friend took at... Um, one of the vaccination sites recently and sent to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, the teachers, they love us. So remember um, that you have a lot of fans out there and I am one of them. And um, that is all. I appreciate each and every one of you for being here. And I'm gonna pass it off to Pam and see if there are any questions. I have no time restraints. So please um, don't feel like you have to, I have to run off somewhere. If you have questions, I know I went through a lot today and you're going to get two lesson plans with this one about the pollination and one about, um, the full animal kingdom, as well as all the resources I showed you and created. Stephanie, that was amazing again. Um, so I, I'll, I'll go back through because you were on a roll. I didn't want to jump in. Oh, we can backtrack. It's okay, Pam. Yep. And there, um, so that's what we'll do, but they're mostly comments about different things you did and ideas around it. Um, Claire says the program Hawks Aloft does free presentations and they showed us four different birds and my students loved it. Oh, yeah. There is, um, Gurpreet is saying that there's a really cool uh, live bears den here in Canada in yeah. Grouse Mountain. That's cool. And um, also um, Gurpreet to the rescue, she gave the author's name of the, um, one of the books that you were sharing, the Lifetime book. And uh, it's Lois M. Schaefer is the author. But I did also mention in the chat that you're going to give all the resources and links and everything. You will have a whole list of every book and author in your lesson plan. And yeah. you will get this PowerPoint, but I didn't want you to have to look through my PowerPoint. So I put it also in the lesson plan. And then I actually commented because I'm a little of a Discovery Channel junkie. And David Attenborough is one of our favorites, but I've seen it several times. But when you were talking about shell um, habitats and our uh, animals and where they live and things, there's a really cool video that he does where um, he shows the little crabs that all line up when they need yeah. to change to a larger shell. It's a great uh, video. Oh, the hermit crabs. The little crabs and they all line up in size order and they move up to the new home. So I think that's a really fun one. It fit in with something you were talking about. I also put a link in there um, about um, uh, the camera that I was talking about with all the live feeds and I actually turned it on and I'm watching the bald eagles that are in uh, Decorah, Iowa right now. Um, I think she's sitting on her nest, um, but there's a couple bald eagle uh, sites, but there's all these other animals. There's the watering holes, uh, but it's called explore.org. And I put it in the chat. Um, Write that down. The other one uh, is that Gurpreet mentioned, you know, when you were talking about um, um, the, the animals like at the state fair and the piglets all nursing the mom, you know, it's an interesting tie-in with uh, National Women's Month. And, um, you know, I really love that idea of uh, the kids understanding, um, you know, the the nursing piglets and nursing moms. And well, when you think cool. about um, a female's breast making milk, when you you think mammary, you get a mammogram, mammal, the word, the words tie together. And so it's really easy to, rem you know, I teach kids that it's like, you know, mammals make milk. And it's, if you see a woman nursing a child, she's a mammal, she's making milk. If you see a woman be, it's okay to feed your baby differently, but also to be, know that um, if you teach them when they're this age, that it's normal, Nobody's going to freak out when they're a teenager and they see a woman breastfeeding is always what I say. So thank you, Gurpreet, for recognizing that. 
And then one other one, Mary uh, mentioned that she had a stream watching, a live stream watching her goldfish tank in her classroom uh, for a while. And uh, oh. she did it for a couple of weeks. And when she took it down, she said it was amazing how many parents asked her to put it back up because so, they used it to go to sleep at night. Wait, so when we went from real learning to virtual, this is what the teacher did to comfort the kids? No, no, no. What happened was we, it was a, we were doing, a, we were working with the Army Corps of Engineers to develop some kind of a program for them with underwater cameras and fish and all this. So I, we were practicing with, eventually we had to get in the water and eventually it would have to take a stream. So we were practicing with our fish in the fish tank. We had learned how to make a stream. And so we left the stream going because we wanted to see how long it would last before it didn't work anymore. And it just kept on going and going. And the parents were like, what? we didn't know parents were watching it. We didn't know anybody was watching it. It was just out there. <laughs> and then I took it down because we were done with our experiment. We figured it all out two or three weeks later. We were all ready to go on to the next step. We took it down. Next thing I go, I got all these parents saying, where'd you go? Where'd our fish go? We need our fish. Put them back. <laughs> Did you put him back? No, I didn't put them back. I took them and put them outside. That <laughs> is so precious and cool. Miss Pam, we have some future apples in this room, I'm pretty sure. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, well, nominations will open again next year for the next. I'm year. just so impressed with the, all of your stories and resources. And this was yeah. a, this, this whole project we were working on was a golden apple award um, grant. Wow. We had a, we got a $3,000 grant and we used, we had a couple of years in a row, we were using that grant to work on this project. And so it was part of that project. So that is so cool. And now oh, I'm like, great. oh, how can I have a live feed? It's funny. Some teachers cool. don't want their animals bothering them when they're teaching. And my last slide shows my cat there. And that I, I had to put that in there because it looks staged, but my cat was amorously snuggling that toad dog. And I thought it was so funny. And she's a very mean cat. She will bite. And she often bites me when I'm teaching. Like if I try to move her off of something, she, and the kids laugh. They think it's so funny. And she never breaks skin, but she's like very, she, she wants to be my owner, not vice versa. And so I always let her come in. And every now and again, it's fun to just be yourself in front of your kids and yell at your cat. So I love, I love that you guys incorporate so much biology already into your classrooms. I could teach about animals and I do all year. It just, it, it's just something that the kids love to learn about no matter what. So, wow. Well, this is, and I know that you guys, I'm middle school and you guys are all younger, but if you're introducing your students to technology, this was all done with an inexpensive Raspberry Pi. Um, it, we just 35 bucks for a Raspberry Pi, another $10 for a camera, put it together, build a little stand, face it into your tank and you're streaming. So it's a really inexpensive way to, to introduce technology to your kids and they can see it at home. When they go home from school, they can see it there. So it's kind of nice. Um, it's just a matter of just getting a Raspberry Pi. I want to do it on my gecko. I yep. have a gecko. They would love that. Just stream it. Yep. That's all you have to do. Watching him eat his little mealworms and crickets. <laughs> um, you know, before, before anybody has to pop off and I, um, you know, we can stay on as long as people have questions as well. But Gurpreet was asking about um, uh, grants and uh, she's asking if there's a ton of grants in America in lieu of class budgets. Um, so that's a very great little segue uh, into me talking about the grant that will be available to, um, and I'm sorry to New Mexico teachers, but uh, there are grants and there is grant money in, uh, in New Mexico, in the US. Um, uh, you just have to do some looking sometimes for it. Um, in other words, uh, and also you have to be willing to do a little work for the grant. So for example, for the Intel grants um, that uh, are going to open uh, after Stephanie's last session are geared towards let's do science. And so you don't necessarily have to purchase the materials exactly as Stephanie has shown you, 
But what we're doing is giving you the opportunity to purchase all the materials that Stephanie used within this workshop and recreate these and make all of this come to life in your own classrooms. Um, you know, if, if you have other ideas or you have other lessons and you've been trying to fund them, you will have the opportunity to discuss it and share your idea. Um, you do get a priority point on the grant if you have participated in this professional development. That's one way that you're going to score a little above other people who don't participate because um, what we know is good education and good lessons also are accompanied with professional development around how to use them. And so when you put those two things together, you're more likely to actually do it and do the activity. So uh, that's what we were trying to build and create and Intel has been very generous. So those grants will range up to $1,500. They will somewhat be based around your class size or the number of students that you serve. And there'll be a, um, there'll be a formula that we use to decide on um, how much of the grant you can receive. So I see some other comments coming up. Um, yeah. Can I add something to that, Pam? Yeah, go ahead. So, and Gurpreet, here in America, in New Mexico, anyways, as an elementary school teacher, I've never been given money to spend on my classroom. So I've spent a lot of my own money. And, and now that I have my own children and I, I want to leave money behind for them, I, I find myself less likely to do it. And um, donorschoose.org has been um, how I've brought so much to my students this year, along with Golden Apple and a few other grants that were really tricky to write. But I love a short grant. I love when it's not too complex. So thank you, Pam, for making it really um, easy for our participants to access some funds and to be able to be creative with them. That's so great. Yeah, you know, Mary also is mentioning that there that Walmart has has grants. Um, so Mary, I'll look into that a little bit more as well to um, see. They have, they have three different levels, so there's yeah. there's, there's. Are they open all the time? Are they a rolling grant? So they're uh, well, yeah, like some of them are open in September, some open in December, and then some are twenty five hundred dollars, some are two hundred dollars, um, but they're all listed in the same site. So you just go to Walmart and research grants through Walmart. They're not hard there's, to get, you know. There's also one called Pets in the Classroom that is almost, um, you get it. Yeah, there's, and if you go to Pets, Pet, not PetSmart, the other Pet, Petland in New Mexico, um, they'll work with you to give your whole, they haven't done this to me because I already have it, found out too late. They'll give you your whole setup your classroom they'll help you get it and reduce the cost tremendously so you have a whole fish tank in your setup in your classroom so um mary, i, I used to have stuff. um like 16 class pets i was mary my ex-husband was a biologist and so he did all the um cleaning and then um you know he's my ex-husband so once we broke up i i just kind of slowly downsized on my pets because I realized it was a lot of work. <laughs> I realized the fish are no longer in my room. That's why they're not being streamed. Those are a piggy fish. They're outside in the aquaponic system and they live out there. I make them stay there year round. I do not <laughs> clean after them anymore. <laughs> All so right, anyway. any, any, other, any other questions or comments from anybody um, for Stephanie while she's here and Doing another awesome, you know, hey, Stephanie, you want to preview for next week what we got? Yeah. So next week we're doing Happy in My Skin and we are going to be um, celebrating the children and their beautiful skin and learning about our bodies and sun safety. Um, and we also are going to incorporate, of course, an artist study within this. Um, and learn how to use color to watercolors to um, paint what we see when we look in a mirror and really love our love our skin, even our blemishes and our warts and our moles and everything about ourselves. And I think it's one of my favorite things to do with kiddos every year because really we need to build them up to love themselves. And I love the book, Happy in My Skin, which was a book I got, I think in the dollar bin at um, Scholastic this year. And, and it's a really great one. So, um, and I, I, I have a lot of fun stuff planned. I won't talk too much about it. 
That is so great. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you to everybody. And thank you, Stephanie, once again, this um, was another awesome workshop and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, adorable. Bye. My cutest attendee right there. <laughs>